Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Two World Podcast. I will be getting us started off today, and I am Barney. And my co-host today, he is joining me, and he is... Jacob! And today we have an interesting topic. I, As I was thinking about the topic that we're discussing today, I thought, um, boy, you know, if we did more production um, with this with this podcast, we could have, like, maybe... Um, uh, like the, the theme from 2001 playing, you know, <laughs> to, to maybe accompany the beginning of this. And um, I know it has a specific name and I, 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 I'm scolding myself for not thinking it up. We're, we're looking it up because I know that um, referencing our live music um, episode that Fish does a really good rendition of that, that theme. Do we right hum there. it? Is that okay? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Who, which one of us wants to do the drums and which one wants to do the, the instruments? <laughs> <laughs> you start with the drum and I'll, okay. I'll, I'll do the drum. Okay. So you do the build up then. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the first press <laughs> nice yeah and then then I, I i panicked that maybe i was getting off tune so you'll have to forgive me if that's true so all of this to say that um jacob uh proposed a really interesting topic of looking at um especially in the different contexts of of where we're living and and even our our jobs um, how has um, AI kind of been playing a role in um, where we are, um, what, how we see it developing in our different contexts, um, and maybe how it might even um, impact or maybe is impacting um, our professions or, or maybe um, those of people that we know or, or that we see and observe in our daily lives. And um, I'd like to start off with you, Jacob, and just kind of one thing that we do sometimes is let's hear the the background, the the impetus, um, um, everything that went into coming up with with this topic today. Absolutely, thanks for asking, Barney, and thanks for being willing to jump into this with me. Um, so for me, I really am fascinated by technology and like to use software and tools to help me when I'm working or thinking about things and preparing for things. And the first time that I really heard about AI as something you could use as a tool was um, when they uh, came, I'm trying to think of the name is it's open AI that um, oh, has, yeah. has, is behind chat GPT. Um, mm-hmm. Well, they announced, I saw it on Google news, this story, you know, that, that there were beta testers starting to use it and you could sign up to be a tester. Uh-huh. Uh, you could join a wait list. And, you know, uh-huh. and then as they unroll it, they will give more and more access to people. And I was just curious because as we had mentioned before starting our podcast, you know, AI has been around for quite a while in science fiction and often um, to the peril of humans. You know, if you think mm-hmm. about um, the um, series like uh, Terminator or other mm-hmm. <laughs> such, um, you know, uh, dystopian science fiction stories, the AI um, in those stories takes over and ultimately enslaves humanity in in, in a way or wants to do away with humanity. And so, you know, I think there's this human fascination with like, what can we do? How much can we create? But also a fear of like, could we create something so bad that it could eventually threaten us? And we have definitely seen that in human history with um, like nuclear technology when it's used Mm -hmm. um, in weaponry. Um, But anyway, um, I signed up for um, ChatGPT, and then I got early access, or I was um, among that first wave of right. people on, on that yeah. sign up list and started playing around with it. And I was just so surprised with how adept it was at responding to general conversational queries. And so, you know, I wanted to test it out in terms of its ability to respond to theological questions, you know, being a person who serves the ministry, I'm like, how would it handle something like this? And I couldn't believe how balanced its answers were. And sometimes I would ask um, questions that had some historical components, you know, related to the the theology I was asking about, like, we've talked before um, 
in previous episodes about how I've done some research in the area of the theology of spiritual gifts. And so I was asking it different questions related to that. And it was coming up with pretty good answers. Not, I wouldn't say necessarily rivaling like the best scholarship you can find, but, um, but pretty good standard general answers, you know? And um, so that surprised me. So I thought, wow, how could this type of tool be used in preparing for talks or presentations, um, you know, to synthesize information. And what I really wanted to do is I, I have a lot of resources that in digital form already, and I wanted to use the tool as a way to take a large amount of the resources I already have and quickly work through them, synth synthesize material, compare and contrast. And so um, that's pretty much how I've been, been using it. Um, since then, I basically when I'm getting ready for um, a message or uh, to teach or give a presentation, when I'm doing my preparation, I'll consult my tools, and then sometimes I will take some of the information and I'll plug it into um, either ChatGPT or I also really like Anthropic's AI client um, tool called Clode. Um, I think that that one's really interesting, and and I'll ask questions um, about you know, the information I have in the resources, sometimes the pinpoint certain aspects of it or relate it to a certain question that I'm asking that, that I've thought about, but I'd like to have a different angle on. And so um, <clears throat> most recently I did uh, a little bit of a test case um, <laughs> with this. And I was telling you about it before our mm -hmm. episode. Um, I had been studying this passage in Hebrew with my friend Cody from Genesis mm -hmm. chapter one and the word for heavens came up in our study and he was asking me questions about it. And I, and I thought, oh, I wanna do a deeper dive into that. So I read, um, I have a number of resources that can unpack the meaning of Hebrew words. And so I read through all of them first on my own and looked through them. And I was drawing my own conclusions because you know sometimes there's quite a bit of overlap between resources, but then sometimes you get different conclusions and you know disparity. And so I thought, I'm going to enter every single one of these lexical yeah. entries into Claude and I'm going to ask it, you know, to compare and contrast them and then rank them in terms of their usefulness for a broader understanding of the Hebrew word for heaven or heavens, mm. which is Shemaim. Mm. And I did. And I was so shocked because um, it went through all those resources and it ranked them almost exactly how I would have based on mm. my years of using them um, just based on this one entry. Um, so, um, it, it said to me that these, um, large language learning models have been trained well enough that they can discern, um, content and material that's specific to a discipline as well as sometimes somebody who's had a fair amount of training in that discipline. I wouldn't necessarily say uh, put them on the level of an expert, but I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, um. I was just, I'm really surprised by that. So um, that kind of sets me, well, well, there's just, as a tool, it's quite powerful. I think you have to know um, what the query should be and how to mm -hmm. use it best. And also be aware that um, it has limits. And sometimes um, certain AI tools have been known to um, hallucinate information, you know, put, put things, you know, draw conclusions that aren't there. Um, which I have a funny story I want to share about that later, but I need to stop talking because I've been going on so long, but that is um, both the reason why I want to talk about it and how I've been using it a little bit, but um, let me turn it to you now and get your thoughts. When you heard that I was interested in this, what were you thinking? And then maybe you could give a little bit of background to our audience about how you've been working with it. If you have. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of made me think of um, kind of a, a, a point that you touched on that it's been around in some form or another um, for a while in a way, like one, one thought that came to mind is like when you had programs that you could enter text and it would read it to you, you know, the, in, in a way that's like at the really very beginning of um, using a tool that we didn't using computers in a way that maybe we didn't think that they would be able to, to do it, you know, to like, just think, wow, this computer program can, can read this, to me, you know, that's something that I never would have guessed that could be possible a few years ago. And, um, and I remember in um, my first year of university, even, and I don't remember how I came upon this resource, but um, I found 
online, um, someone who was um, researching language, and he had his own program that he developed called um, Jabberwacky, you know, kind of um, related to the Lewis Carroll um, character, the Jabberwocky. And um, it was supposed to be able to chat with you. Um, you know, like you could ask it questions and it would give you responses. And sometimes they were passable, but more often than not, um, they they really didn't quite make sense with your answer. It was, just, you could tell that that um, it had a ways to go, but and I, I tried to I tried to find that resource again, and I think it has since been taken down. But um, you know, people had been thinking about how can there be a way to um, communicate in a sensible way with with artificial intelligence. And um, here, you know, obviously it's been really sustained effort, and here we're coming up with with a lot of of new things that are um, workable in a way. And and like you said, are are passable and to some degree. And um, when we thought about, as I've been thinking about this for the past weeks, and you know, especially thinking about um, some of the maybe potential um, uh, downsides to it, you know, like hearing how students <laughs> you, you really um, clued into this and and realized it could help them. Um, quickly get their homework done <laughs> in a way to, to put it, to put it, um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, in, in a way there, but, um, then, then that really opens up the question. Then I, when the question I've been thinking of, and we'll probably get into this topic a little bit deeper is, um, you know, it's a huge pain to write research papers. <laughs> it's a huge, huge pain. I've done the research. Is it so bad if I enter my data and ask, um, you know, and then let's say that I use um, a, a, an analysis tool, you know, the, to to um, uh, to look at the the data in the right way using the right um, formula that I want to use, and so I do all the work except for the writing. Is that so bad <laughs> that mm. that I ask AI to, you know, the research is mine, the program, you know, the the whole project is mine just, you know, slogging through pages and pages of, you know, what ends up being kind of like um, rote in a way, you know, everyone kind of writes the same way, you know, everyone kind of writes the same things, everyone kind of does this, you know, it's not until you get into um, describing your, um, your, your um, research project, and then analyzing the, um, the data and seeing how that's relevant that you get to something new. So, you know, couldn't I just ask AI to write the first half of my paper for me? Mm. <laughs> and yeah. and that and I wonder, you know, because of course a lot of people would say, no, you know, you've got to do it yourself. But then a lot of people would also probably say, like me, you know, well, what's the harm in just getting through the first part, you know, to the, you know, through kind of the the window dressing until you get to the real um heart of what the research project is about. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I would I would love to talk about that, Barney, because um, mm -hmm. I think both of us, I think we can appro approach this from um, a couple of lenses. And one is having both gone through graduate school um, mm -hmm. where like there is an emphasis on um, originality of your mm -hmm. research and, and academic rigor and um, doing your own work and citing all of your sources and in particular, not taking credit for things that aren't your own. Um, I think there has to be a way to uphold academic integrity like that. Um, if you want to use the AI tool, there has to be a way to uphold that while at the same time using the tool in a way that benefits you, but doesn't replace the originality and the academic rigor. And so what I'm thinking is like, so for the example you gave, if somebody has a lot of data, I think it might be helpful to like, you know, do some reflection, do their own work with it. But then, you know, a good use of the AI tool might be, you know, to kind of check your work or to say, or, or to see if there's things you missed, uh, connections you missed in the data, because AI is able to take such a large amount of data. And if you, you can apply very specific parameters and the questions you ask it, and it can crunch the, and the data and can see a bigger picture sometimes that we, we might miss certain things. So I think if you do your own work, and then you use this model is another 
complement to that to help you see maybe some things you've seen. And then I think the academic community is probably going to get better and better about how to name or, or recognize when AI is used. For example, um, I don't know, I saw a commercial recently for Grammarly. And, mm -hmm. you know, Grammarly is this um, writing assistant tool that up to this point has been kind of like a souped up version of like Microsoft Word's spell right. checker, you know, right. but now that it has the power of these large language learning models integrated in, it can, you know, give larger, more powerful suggestions about the grammar and the structure of your writing. Um, so I noticed in the commercial, it said, and, um, you know, use Grammarly to help you write even better and then acknowledge it um, when in oh. when you cite your sources or something. And, and it had this, and the person had a <laughs> button and it showed like a history of how they used Grammarly for their paper. Mm -hmm. um, and then I spoke with um, an English teacher who is in um, a Catholic high school in Cleveland. And I was asking him about like his approach with his students. And he said, if they can show how they use the tool in the process of their writing, not as a replacement for their own right. thinking and their own writing, but mm -hmm. to show like if it helped them think or frame certain questions or how what is it stimulating to them to get the ball rolling in certain areas, you know, maybe just kind of um, even a general question to get them thinking in a certain area. Can you generate a question for me about, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, Ella Fitzgerald's use of, you know, you could, you could plug mm -hmm. in to mm -hmm. get them thinking, but um, if they use it in the process to help the reflection it's an aid, but if they if they just want to plug in a, um, something and quickly spit out and copy and paste, obviously that's um, ethically, um, um, how do I want to say it, um, misguided, and it's it's not doing the work, and it's 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 essentially akin. It's like akin to plagiarism in a way, I mean, even though the AI that's generating the text isn't site isn't um, a published author as such of it, but. Um, so I don't know, those are my thoughts. Like, I think there's a place for it as a tool, as a complement to what you have, but it should never be like wholesale, um, you know, just copied and pasted it for sure. It should only be used as a tool to help stimulate and come alongside. And, um, and your point too about, well, what about just getting started? Yeah, I think it could help somebody in terms of some reflection questions or get them ro ball rolling in their mind of, you know, how to tackle something, but shouldn't be a replacement. So what, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I loved your idea, your suggestion, especially about looking at data that, or, or looking at the whole project, you know, it might be that AI said, well, you know, you, you know, you could use it as a tool. Um, I, again, what I've been thinking about, you know, kind of a devil's advocate thing and thinking, you know, what if it, it's very possible that it said, you know, um, it, it would be, you know, before you start the research project, you know, it would come up with suggestions of probably ways to approach the project in the first place and might be different from what you were thinking. And then when it comes to looking at data, there are so many different methods of analyzing data. And the hardest part is understanding which method you need to use. And again, like the AI would probably recommend, you know, what about looking at it using this method or this method, you know, um, there are so many different ways to chart it or graph it or whatnot. And they would, it would probably come up with a way to help you see it in a different way and maybe see connections that you weren't necessarily looking at, but then you would have to double check with, um, you know, like kind of the standard recognized data analysis tools that, um, that researchers are supposed to be using, um, to confirm whether or not that, that, um, you know, that significance or correlation actually exists. Um, when, one kind of interesting thought that I had would be, um, and I don't know if you should necessarily do this, but thinking about AI and its uses from, from your point of view, I wonder what it would be like if you asked, um, AI, you know, it would to like come up with like, like a call to worship or like, you know, like a 15 minute sermon and then just read that word for word. And then see how it is received by by people if if it is actually um, um, inspirational or if like it's kind of obvious that that this wasn't really written by a person or if it's um, you know you know actually very passable and like something that's that's very thought provoking because um, I think of of the many fields where like you really couldn't replace a person it seems like something dealing with faith. Um, 
is, and especially someone like a pastor would be almost impossible to, to replace that job with um, using AI with, I would think. Arnie, that's a really great question. And I have um, uh, explored AI as a tool, like when I'm getting ready for sermon, certain sections, like as I'm thinking about it, I'll, I'll ask questions that help me reflect on the topic to the AI and get, or I'll, I'll do, like I said before, like I'll do I'll have my own reflection and I want to compare it to see like what the AI's um, analysis of the passage or a word will be. But um, I don't feel like it would work super well to just try to do, to tell the AI, like write me a sermon about such and such, because I feel uh-huh. like um, first off the AI tends to, have a very condensed form of output that is um, like, it's very concise and mm-hmm. it um, is readable as like a dictionary entry, you know, but it, it, it as a sermon, um, it might be, it, it would adapt its style for sure because AI and language models are trained on, I'm sure sermon texts are in their database so they can, <laughs> they can emulate. But um, I think um, it would, what it would generate would probably be um, like short and concise and wouldn't be fleshed out and would be very generic. And so part uh-huh. of the task of like a minister or a pastor or somebody who's teaching in a community is to relate the passage to the unique needs and situation that's in their community and in their congregation. So um, I don't think, unless that the AI was given a lot of parameters, um, it would even know in is, like how to zero in on those. And even if it were given the parameters, it would feel um, somewhat impersonal. So I think the AI, just like that English teacher said, it could be used in the preparation process, I think, mm-hmm. by somebody writing a message to say, you know, is there reviewing material and trying to think of a way to, you know, um, explore certain ideas and combined ideas. And like the AI could stimulate the thinking. And then I think after they've done that work and reflected, they try to adapt that into their own language and into their context for their community it would be helpful. Now, interestingly enough, for a call to worship, which is a much more focused statement, mm-hmm. um, you can, I, I have used AI before just to see like, what could a sample of call to worship be related to the theme of Pentecost, for example, you know, mm-hmm. and as it relates to this passage, like you could, you could give it some parameters and sometimes it'll give some words or it'll give a call to worship that's formulaic and you can, you know, you can, um, you know, tweak that. Um, mm-hmm. but I would say like, that's another case where it was good for the writing process. Like you could see a sample of what, what one looks like, but then I would think it would be helpful to, um, to like personalize it, make it related to, like the local community and, and the language that, you know, makes sense and resonates with the people there. So I think as a tool in the writing process, it can be helpful. It can give you examples, some um, ideas as you're thinking about. Um, But I do know, and I had heard that there was one worship service, uh, maybe several months ago where everything in the service was um, generated by AI. It was like an experiment. Did you hear Mm -hmm. about that? So, Uh I mean, it can be, it can be done. But um, I kind of feel like uh, what you said earlier is very helpful. It's like uh, helpful. It's meaningful to have a human being with the creativity and the calling, the sense of of commitment to the local community to try to um, work on these things instead of you know just uh, having them generated for us. It feels like um, that to me is not the, a good use of the tool. Um, it would be more as a help is what I would see it. And the same could probably be said for artists and authors and any creative enterprise and writers, like you could generate, there are books for sale on Amazon that are AI generated books, but like, why, why are we trying to replace the artistic enterprises? Like that's one area of human life and existence that is, seems kind of uniquely, uh, what matched with the human spirit, like we were saying last week in the episode about um, uh, burning down the house, you know, with Northern exposure, like that something within the human soul and the spirit yearns to express itself in art and AI can create artistic expression, but it doesn't seem like the most pertinent um, use of that tool. And one of my friends, um, Mark Suter, 
who has a podcast that he does on Star Wars called um, Tarkin's Top Shelf. Just a shout out to him <laughs> in his podcast. But he, we were talking about this this past week, and that was his main point because he's an author. And he said, why would we as a society want AI to start generating this content? We have all these artists, authors willing to do it um, and, and stirred up to do that and caring about it. So um, I feel like that um, is a little bit of... Um, a quandary or, or an ethical dilemma like to not um, what um, surrender that part of our society to just say, oh, you know, machines can generate this. And I don't even know, and I wouldn't even say that, that what is generated at this point would rival, you know, obviously what the humans creating. I mean, I mean, some AR, AI art is incredible and it's amazing what can be done with it, but I wouldn't say as a, in the totality, oh, it can just be substitute for human art but but what do you think about that barney yeah um i think that um especially thinking in terms of stories and and um writing in that way that that there's something about the imagination and about um like you say the stirring and um like when an author gets an idea of, of a story and just is so dedicated and devoted to get it started and get it going and then I think about the books that I've read and that I'm reading and um, how, how they draw you in and how you can imagine it yourself. And you can sense that the author was imagining something similar when that person was writing um, the story as well. And yeah, I, I, I've never read in it a book written by AI, but I imagine it probably wouldn't be so captivating or it would probably just end up reading like one of those books that, you know, like you just see like that are, you know, just mass produced and, and just, just out there for, for a book to be out there, not, not as any kind of something to grip you and, you know, um, move you and have you reflect on, 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 on the world around you, on your, on yourself, thanks to that book. And, um, yeah, probably that's probably the same way that it would go with, um, uh, with, um, with visual art too. Um, think, thinking of this and um, thinking back to um, <laughs> to actually another podcast, a radio show, um, This American Life, I heard one of my favorite episodes was when they use numbers in the way that they shouldn't be used. And there were two researchers who um, collected, um, they did two different ways. They Their first research project was to surveyed numerous people on what kind of art that they liked from different countries. And then they produced some art, visual art based on survey responses. And then later they, they researched people, you know, they surveyed people, all these people, what kind of music do they like? What are the topics? What's the length? What kind of, um, you know, what kind of instruments, what kind of singers do you like? And they went and they produced two songs. They produced the most popular song, and then they produced the least popular song. And the most popular song, you know, it's like three minutes, 21 seconds, you know, it has like soft um, um, saxophone and it has like, you know, like kind of R&B sound to it, you know, and and it's about relationships and, and it's just, you know, passable. It's like a song that you've heard millions of times. And then the least popular song, it's like 21 minutes long. It has cowboy music, it has opera, it has songs about holidays, it has jingles in it, and there's something about it that is so interesting. <laughs> and and it, and that in that way is taking something that um, you know it shouldn't be done. You know, we shouldn't try to quantify and then produce music that way, or you know, either through research or through AI, and then. Flipping it on its end, on on its on its end there, and going exactly the opposite, and it created something artistic in that way. So, um, you know, if if we would kind of an illustration, if we would just let AI come up with our music and our books and our art, we would end up something that we've all seen, however many times. And yeah, it's interesting, but it's forgettable. But then, if we allow humans to take that and come up with their creativity, then we come up with this wild song and other things like that and um yeah i think that's something that just can't be replaced in, in these kind of elements like like art and whatnot that um that's a really good point um mm -hmm. and maybe 
um, just for a moment, if we could relate this, um, specifically thinking about artists to um, the idea that, that um, there is some kind of um, ethical um, commitment to the, the source and the, and the creativity of each artist. That's why we have our copyright system. And, and the fact that AI through machine learning has been trained on thousands and millions and however many um, incredibly large amounts of texts and images of, in many cases, works that, you know, the artists themselves may or may, or may not have known what were even being scanned and, and, and analyzed, you know, and then when the AI renders its own amalgamation of, from all these different things of, of, of artistic expression, you know, some of that, some portion of that could be taken from, you know, the inspiration of specific artists. And what does that mean? It, it's, uh, I, I know a group of artists um, I had read recently were, were suing some of the um, AI companies because their, their books had been scanned in without them knowing, you know? And so if part of this language learning model was trained on their content and, and when an, a query or something is asked of it that to produce something, it could generate some portion of their work. You know, what is the ethical responsibility of the company? I know I'm taking this in a different way maybe than you were just a moment ago, but I kind of wondered uh, if you had any thought about maybe the, the peril of that, the challenge of that, you know, as it relates to this idea of the realm of creativity and art and safeguarding the artist from yeah. uh, plagiarism or... And actually to, to reference our last podcast again, you know, where Chris, Chris made that wonderful point, you know, repetition is the death of art. And, mm. um, you know, if someone, if AI comes up with some painting or something or some story that, wow, oh, wow, this looks like it could be a Monet or something, but, um, but then, you know, there's something lost in it because there's, there's not that same force that was behind what Monet really painted or what Shakespeare really wrote, you know, I, I think that that is the one element that just can't be reproduced. And there's that captivity, the, the captivation that comes with it. And I think also to reference another podcast with that we had with Chris Matzos, that catharsis, you know, that comes from, from something being produced on the stage, you know, or some, some, the reason why we go see movies, you know, the reason why we listen to live music, you know, the reason why, um, you know, we have favorite authors, even there's something that, that the human soul, that, that something in our heart really connects with this and keeps drawing us back to that. And um, if it's just something that's mass produced, then there's just something that's going to be lost. But, but yeah, then to, how would you feel? I can just, really understand how those authors are feeling if you know it probably made them feel like it cheapened their work mm -hmm. to have it just scanned and then reproduced in, in in part or in whole or or kind of slightly altered and then um people who didn't know the original work read this and they think oh whoa hey wow that's really amazing this ar is really fantastic not knowing that it was based on you know, what someone else had actually written from, you know, deep within, you know, their struggle to get that put out. And, yeah, but, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. But I was wondering if maybe, you know, talking about art and talking about whatnot, you know, we have, I think we have a little interesting image that we could probably look yes. at, especially for those of you watching on YouTube. Um, Jacob, why don't you introduce what we're about to look at? Yes. Yeah, so, before recording, Barney and I thought it would be interesting to use Microsoft's Bing image generator um, to create several sample logos for what a podcast on AI could look like. And so it generated four images for us and here they are on the screen. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, if I were to create a logo about AI, I don't know that I would have thought of either of these oh, i mean yeah. um, yeah. um it seems like a number of them are trying to give the imagery of a brain tissue 
between mm. headphones. Do you sense that? Yeah. Like, yeah. like well, neural network slash, like in some cases, it looks like the brain tissue, the way it's yeah, the really. curvature. And so mm-hmm. I, I guess I wouldn't have thought of that. I don't know what I would have thought of, but it's different than I would have expected. Um, what are your thoughts, Barney? Yeah, I completely agree. And and I wonder if um, if you feel the same way that at least three of these kind of um, give, have like kind of a sinister mm. mo- motif, sinister yeah. theme to them. Like the, the yeah. very first one, the top left with the dark background, the, the, and then kind of modeled after a brain with like two eyes. Yes. And it really does not look happy. It does not. And then, and then the one right to it had the colors are cheerful, but I look at the left and there's kind of like a blue dot inside again, what looks like it could be eyes. And that gives it that plus kind of the harder lines that are slanted also gives it a sinister look. Hmm. <laughs> and then the bottom left one, that one just makes me think of Dracula in a way. Oh, wow. Looks, yeah. um, really spooky, to be honest. Um, it again, looks like it could be maybe like half neural network, like you're saying, and then half person. Like or a cyborg. Robot. Yeah. Or cyborg androids, is a good way. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and then it has a lot of red in it, and that's probably where my brain was coming up with the Dracula part, and um, and then the final one I think is supposed to meant meant to kind of look nice and happy, but it again really plays on the the theme of a uh, brain, and they all have like a metallic feel to them, I guess, kind of the the machinery part to it, and so none of them are exactly, in my opinion, none of them are so appealing and definitely none of them are so soothing to yes. look at yeah i i agree barney i feel like i don't know if it feels like an exaggeration to say that they're kind of um vapid or like soulless but like there's <laughs> yeah. something to the art that it's it's it re- was a what a response to a query so you can see mm-hmm. how this was generated based on what you said but it it doesn't seem there's not a warmth or a it doesn't feel inspiring. Um, right. Uh, I like to use pictures and images and sermons. And I entered some queries before in to wonder if some AI image would, you know, be like a good alternative to a picture. And I just, I just really struggle to find any that ever feel like, a, uh, like a fit. And it, it it's fascinating to me, you know, if the, if this is just an object lesson here, if this is how we feel about this imagery, you could probably push that out and s- say similar things about text, you know, or a- AI generated music or AI generated, if there are, you know, is film or video, like you could feel a sense of like, it feels like it's um, different or lacking that some of the warmth or the, I guess, I don't know if you say humanity of the artists, um, I'm not sure, but um, it, it reminds me of, um, this podcast that Katie was listening to a while back. And um, I think it was a podcast with maybe a sociologist or a psychologist. And she had taken her daughter to a zoo and, but there was this one area where they had um, an electronic turtle. And like, it was kind of odd because, you know, there were live animals elsewhere and her daughter seemed really into it. And, and she went up to her daughter and she's like, or maybe she debriefed with her afterwards. And she's like, you know, that turtle wasn't real. Right. Is what she said to her daughter. And she's like, I know I didn't care. It was still really cool to see. And um, she kind of really, after talking with her daughter more about it, just got the impression that her, it didn't bother her daughter that it wasn't a real turtle. She just enjoyed looking at it all the same, but for her, like the parent, she, wasn't interested in it because it was like robotic. And so like, I wonder if that sentiment could be applied to AI art and AI literature and whatever else. Um, it's just, if somebody knows that it was generated by AI and they know that there's not an, another human on the other side of that with their aspirations and, and yearnings and dreams and wishes, like would it change their experience? And I think it would for a lot of people. Like, and some people might say they don't care. Um, but I think a lot of people would be like, well, if, it, if there's no other human on the other end of that. Like I'm, I'm not interested in looking at it because it's not real, you know? So I guess that's the question is uh, what constitutes what is real 
and what is not real and in terms of you know art we look at or literature that we things that we seek to read um and so i don't know if you have any thoughts on that yeah it would it would make me curious about that that worship service that you mentioned um if the people knew ahead of time that it would all be done you know everything that would be read you know and, and whatnot in the service was by ai i think i think a lot of people would respond that oh well that wasn't fulfilling but um and then of course you really wouldn't want in something like church you wouldn't want to deceive people you know in order to get their honest reaction to you know not being um um you know, uh, not not knowing ahead of time, you know, to change their thinking of what they're going to get into, it would almost be like you have to have two whole sermons, two whole worship services. Um, but uh, and I think it also um, get, gets that 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 in, interesting illustration from the story. We have um, a small child and we have an adult, and it shows how much with experiences in life that are interpreted by the experiences that we have had before. You know, why it's paintings that we see that we connect with stories, you know, movies that really touch us, um, you know, things, those touch us because of, they they resonate with our experience with what we've been through in our lives. And, and as adults, we've collected so many more experiences. You know, probably that mom has, played with a real turtle or seen a real turtle or had some real, you know, turtle experience to, to uh, honestly, I would probably be the same way to re react like, well, what is the nice thing about this? You know, but the, for the daughter seeing it through such a less experienced lens, you know, it's just cool. <laughs> Look at this. It's just cool. You know, and I don't mind. It's just cool. You know, so um, it, it, will be interesting to see as we look at people who are growing up with AI as a bigger and bigger and bigger part of their lives, how they feel as they get older and accumulate more experiences where AI has been kind of in the background, um, at least at the beginning, maybe more so as they get older. Um, I know for one thing, uh, the, the, the news on the, um, the kind of, I guess, like public um tv station you know we all it's <laughs> tv here in japan is much much different than america we um it almost nobody has cable tv so standard tv is basically just nine channels and um we are very 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 much expected there are a few gray areas but expected to pay for one of the channel kind of like the what would be the equivalent of the public broadcasting um channel but but you know, that's supported by people who willingly make donations. We don't, we kind of, we rationalize it to make ourselves feel better for kind of having to pay for this. But um, the news that they have every morning, um, there's one segment always that um, it's just, you know, video footage, but it's read by the AI. It's not, we don't see them. We we don't see the, the AI or whatnot. You know, we don't see the newscasters doing whatever they're doing. We just see the images and we hear the AI reading the news force and they have a, a, a male voice and they have a male ish voice and a female ish voice that read. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that it, it sounds, I didn't know until my wife told me that that's what's going on. I couldn't really spot the difference because the intonation is just right. And according to the Japanese language and um, you know, it sounds like what you would think someone reading the news would say how they would speak it. And that makes sense because the news is pretty serious and you don't have to have a lot of different inflection, you know, to create a lot of different motions. You're just delivering what happened. And it's, it's, a, but it's a start. And how will things go for my kids when, um, especially here in Japan with the population size changing um, and not necessarily, um, um, immigration, whatnot, um, um, programs and efforts, um, adjusting to keep up with the, 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 um, decline in population. So I think that we'll have a lot of more things that are done by AI or run by AI or however, um, how will my kids or their kids respond 
you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 60 years from now. Um, and when they see, you know, art done by people or when they see art or movies done by, you know, their good friend AI, you know, um, how or or mechanical turtles or, um, you know, like some, you know, mechanical woolly mammoths, you know, how will it impact them as it might impact someone like like us here and now? Um, would be interesting to somehow, if possible, observe and and talk about. That's a really good point, Barney. Um, expectations and experience and how a younger generation that grew up with the technology already there versus those of us who remember a time when it didn't exist or was much different. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. Well, I was fascinated thinking about this topic and specifically your context in Japan, because um, for years, you know, it seems like Japan has had a kind of a pretty cutting edge industry related to robots and, and um, just technology in general, you know, being innovative and, and using almost like, um, have you seen stories about like robot pets or, or, you know, <laughs> different that, using it as a, as a tool to help humans improve their quality of life. And so I wondered, you know, if you sense that the narrative or the general conversation around AI in Japan might be a little different or further along than it is here in the States. I don't know if you would sense that. Yeah, I really have to wonder. I think that it probably, probably is so. Um, and like you say that, I think like it's a lot of um, adapting based on the situation that we're in. You know, it's an island country and, um, you know, and it's not a big one and has an aging, aging population. It has people that um, are very, very, very busy. And so on the one hand, you know, it's hard to um, go visit your grandparents, maybe on the one hand. And so if they can have this kind of companion animal that um, doesn't require so much care, you know, you don't have to feed it. You don't have to take it on a walk. You don't have to clean up after it. Um, then yeah, that really helps serve a purpose in a way. Um, uh, and, um, and I think maybe you have seen, um, articles. I think I even saw something on CNN, maybe about like these mechanical wolves that are, um, like scaring away bears, I think. And like, they have like these really scary red eyes, but, um, Again, it's it's in response to um, like a situation where more and more people are moving away from these smaller villages into cities. And then so there are less people around to kind of keep the wolves, uh, the bears, um, you know, more toward the forest. And then the bears, probably their habitat is changing too. And then so they have a need to um, kind of go in into an area where it's easier for them to find what they need. And um, yeah, kind of, so then we find these kind of, you. I wonder if they're pretty unique, maybe based on, compared with other nations, you know, these um, other contexts, these kind of unique situations, these unique problems that, that come up and the easiest or the best, I don't know the best, maybe the easiest or um, maybe people's first thought is how can we have maybe a machine or something to kind of help at least help us to address this this need that we've found arising just because um um it's hard to you know we we at this moment right now we aren't able to address it how we had been you know with with people and um yeah, i think that they find that that in a way that um yeah i think people are more familiar with with robots because like you say there's been kind of a cutting edge sense with technology and and people are are um you know i mean what like all of the gundam um uh comic books and and mangas the and anime the the um the cartoons where you see lots that's really japan has lots and lots and lots of robots in some of its um literature and some of its you know movies and whatnot and i think maybe maybe that's why maybe people are more readily um happy to i think part of it is they see um this kind of technological advancement you know 
wow, I can clap my hands and this robot dog like sits up, you know, or it recognizes my voice, you know, and, um, uh, and I think that that's neat. And then if it can also in that way, serve, serve a, a positive purpose of, of companionship in a way, um, then yeah, that's, that's really neat too. And I think that, that from a number of different, um, aspects and reasons and influences that maybe it has, is going, um, ahead further or at a faster pace here in Japan than, than other places. That's really interesting, Barney. And that makes me think a little bit about the question of how will AI impact society more broadly? Um, there is the kind of optimistic look that you might find in like a sci-fi series like Star Trek, for example, where in the future, um, due to the technology and advancement in um, yeah, human society, that inequality is done away with. And, you know, that there's um, all of this opportunity to not only sustain life on earth, but so much so then that people look out to the stars and are seeking to make, you know, contact with other civilizations. And, um, very optimistic view like you can generate any type of food you want just by asking the computer and you can travel you know to, from this place to another almost instantaneously with technology so it's a very optimistic i feel view and then like we already referenced before the kind of dystopian um take that's you know in the terminator movies so i guess <laughs> i'm kind of wondering you know for your own outlook um what do you think the future is i mean i know these things are big questions it's hard to you know really guess or, or to know in any sense but what what is your own take are you more optimistic about the um, promise of ai and what it, how it will impact society are you more guarded what are your thoughts yeah i, I wonder if um may, maybe i'm even being i don't know naive or um maybe not not as well, well as informed as I should be, but I, I keep finding myself um, fascinated that, that, that AI can do all of these things. And um, like, and there's so much that I wasn't aware of that it, that it could do. Um, but I always, I always, I always have this, I don't think that I lean toward the dystopian side at all. I always kind of have this, this notion that, um, that I, I don't know why maybe I'm being naive still, but thinking, well, how, how could it get out of control? You know, how could, how could things go, go that, that badly? How could, how could there be like, no, no way to, to, um, you know, how could AI become so powerful that, that it can do these things, you know? Um, I don't know, but at, at the moment it, it does, you know, <laughs> I always, I, I see, a lot of people here who maybe their job has been reduced or um you know augmented by ai and and i do have the the nagging you know kind of notion you know thought in the back of my mind you know um you know maybe it's a little selfish but thinking oh thankfully i'm a language teacher for kids you know because that's something that that ai could never replace but i always think you know what about other people who you know AI is kind of taking their job because it's easier for the robot to do it and faster. And um, that really, since since we're at a place right now where um, we all remember how things used to be and we, you know, um, people who are older, um, but still working, you know, they went to school for a certain job and, and it's, you know, hard to make such an adjustment now that, that, technology is changing, you know, and we're not sure how to, it's new and we're not sure how to, what to do with it, how to, um, and how to integrate it so well. And then, you know, it, people may, might, might be worried about, about their position, um, in the workforce and, and how they're going to, um, you know, um, keep their paycheck making, you know, in their lifestyle that, that, that also nags at me on the one, the one hand. And hopefully, like we were talking about earlier, that it's people see it as a tool to um, generate ideas, but then uh, um, in the end, allow for and um, have the humans be the ones who who are who are in charge of creating and producing 
the final product and um and not not thinking you know here's my big chance to you know look at the bottom line you know and save all this money by just having a robot do it instead of instead of people who who have been dedicated to this company all these years you know hopefully that that is the thinking that 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 wins out but i don't know how um how do you see things shaping up for yourself well it's interesting because um there so far there is a little bit of an economic disparity with availability of ai for example um if you use chat gpt or um anthropics cloud um G, uh, ai system the free versions have many more limitations than the paid versions so um it's just fascinating that they're very powerful tools even the free versions um I know for Claude, you get so many queries before you, it tells you you need to take a break and you won't have access again for like, I don't know if it's four or five hours, something like that. So in terms of um, disparity and economic disparity and opportunity, even right now, you know, these companies are trying to monetize these systems, you know, like any product that a company makes. So um, I think it's complicated and that's maybe where government regulations comes in and um, what governments should consider about the use of AI and privacy and accountability. And I think if we have, like we have done with other things, like um, in efforts to curb, you know, the pro proliferation of nuclear weapons with a non-proliferation treaty, or, you know, if there, there are different um, technologies that we've have sought, you know, across government systems to regulate um, it's been helpful. And so I'm hope, hoping that there'll be regulations that help work towards making sure that AI is uh, a safe tool and as much as possible and not used for hacking and fraud and, you know, um, impersonating others and can um, respect the, the um, intellectual property of individuals and things like that. So, so, um, but um, I am an optimist in general. So I think it, it is a tool that has a lot of promise and as it continues to be integrated with things that we do, it will make some really um, helpful additions to what we're able to do and, and things that we're able to use and use it for will help us have some really interesting advances. So yeah, I think on the whole, I'm optimistic. I just think that there do, do need to be some guardrails, so to speak, or things in place, because even as it's getting started now, you can all, almost see how there could be a greater disparity with it, depending on a person's resources. So, yeah. Um, are there any other thoughts or questions that you would like to address before we close our episode? You no, know, it's been um, such an interesting topic to look into, and I had a great time today for sure. Thanks, Barney. Me too. Really appreciate you being willing to explore this topic with me. And also thank you to our listeners and viewers for coming along with us in this conversation. If you have any thoughts about AI that you would like to share with us, please feel free to include them in comments and responses to our podcast. And thank you for uh, joining in for this time. We really appreciate it. And until next time. <laughs>